welcome to worship from the community here at Kiel or wherever you may be. We pray that as we worship together, we might know God's presence with us. Creator of the cosmos, of eternity and time, be, be with us. us. Saviour of the world, healer of the nations, be, be with, with us. us. Breath of all that lives, of people near and far, stir, stir within, within our, our lives. lives. Maker, Spirit, Son, God of the here and now, be, be present, present in our worship. worship that we may find new ways to be present in your world. Shout for joy, praise God, you who believe in justice. Shout for joy, praise God, you who walk in God's way. Tune up your instruments, strike up the band, sing God new songs. Give it all you've got. God's word is always true. God's work is everlasting. God who loves justice and fairness fills the whole earth with goodness. God's word created in the heavens and all that shines in the sky. God set a limit for the seas and stored their depths below. Let the whole earth stand in awe, revering its mighty maker. God spoke the world into being. God commanded and earth appeared. God shatters a country's intentions and foils a nation's plan. But God's intentions are constant. Heaven's purpose have no end. Monarchs are not saved by armies, nor warriors by their great strength. Weapons meant for war do not guarantee safety. God's eye rests on the faithful, who hope in God's constant love to deliver their souls from death and keep them alive through disaster. Our, our souls wait, wait for God, God our help and defence, our hearts delight in our Maker, whose holy name we cherish.
Let us pray. In the mystery of the beginning of things, Creator God, you made this planet. Rock upon layer of rock to be weathered and planted, to become a place for living. In the mystery of human life, parent God, you made us. Flesh and blood and spirit and bone. Image of yourself. In the mystery of your unconditional love, Redeemer God, you came. You dwelt with us in Jesus flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, to buy us back from our captivity, back to our true belonging together, daughters and sons of heaven, living and loving here on earth. So here in this sacred moment, in this time of struggle and safety, we rest, content or cautious, to know your presence, to hear your word, to sense your spirit, welcoming us and waiting once again. And if in the quiet, in the stillness, there comes to mind the broken or the wounded bits of our lives and of the world, Help us to name some of them now. And as you have shared our deepest sufferings, so may the glue of your transforming grace be for us and for our world, amending once again. And in this time, In this moment, may your spirit touch us. Then in your mercy, turn your face to us. In ourselves, our world, our neighbour. And help us to live our lives rooted in you the God of all. Amen. The Gospel reading is from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. So today is Trinity Sunday, the only feast day in the church's calendar that's dedicated to a doctrine. All the others remember events or people, 
but this one is dedicated to a doctrine, what we believe about who God is. And it's always been an important doctrine to me because I love the idea of the Trinity. I love the thought that God is relationship, that at the very heart of who God is, is a loving relationship, a dance of love into which we're drawn and invited. I love the mystery that God is one and three, three and one, she and he and they, a wholeness that's more than the sum of its parts, just like a song that's sung in harmony is more than the separate lines. I love the fact that we can use the pronoun they for God in both the singular and the plural form. Good doctrine matters. It opens our eyes to fresh wonders and brings life and bears fruit. It makes us excited when we reflect on it, even if we can't really get our heads around it, perhaps especially if we can't really get our heads around it. Richard Rohr said, mystery is not that which is unknowable, it's that which is endlessly knowable. And it's a characteristic of good doctrine that it's endlessly knowable. It's not a tidy formula that reduces mystery to a balanced equation or a pat phrase. With good doctrine, there's always more to ponder, more to explore, more to know. And that exploration is life-giving. I love the fact that our God is relational, community, connectional, a dance, a party, an embrace. We need that truth more than ever in these times of distance and isolation. We need to remember that drawing closer to God, becoming more the people that we were made to be, means becoming more connected, more relational. It means going out to all nations, as Jesus told us, with the good news of a God who not only loves, but is love. The love between the persons of the Trinity that overflows out to everyone. It means breaking down barriers and welcoming in those who are different to us. So where do I, a safe, privileged, educated, wealthy, white, cisgendered woman, begin to find the words to preach on that relational, barrier-breaking God? In a week when racism is at the forefront of so many of our minds and the Black Lives Matters protests have filled our TV screens and social media feeds with frightening images. When rubber bullets and tear gas are used to clear away peaceful protesters, clergy and medical teams from outside a church in Washington <clears throat> so that the president can turn up for a photo op. Maybe some of you are wondering, do they have to riot? Maybe you're thinking about the destruction of property and why can't people protest peacefully? Well, you wouldn't be the only one thinking that. This week, the US Vice President Mike Pence tweeted this. We believe in law and order in this country. We condemn violence against property or persons. We will always stand for the right of Americans to peacefully protest and let their voices be heard. You've probably heard of a US football star and civil rights activist called Colin Kaepernick, who took to kneeling rather than standing during the playing of the American national anthem at the start of his matches as a protest against systemic racism and specifically the unlawful and terrifyingly routine killing of black people by police in the US. I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of colour, he said. To me, this is bigger than football and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. It's hard to imagine a more peaceful, respectful way of protesting than kneeling during a national anthem, but it still cost Colin Kaepernick his career. He hasn't been signed to a team since the end of that first season of protests in 2016. But other players followed his lead, and the following year, Mike Pence, remember him, the one who will always stand for the right of Americans to peacefully protest, walked out of an NFL game in disgust when some of the players knelt during the anthem, which, of course, he knew they were going to do. Why aren't protests always peaceful? Well, actually, many of them are. And sometimes when they're not, it's the actions of a few agitators or a response to overly aggressive policing. Even when they're none of those things, peaceful protest has been tried for decades. No one listens. As Dr Martin Luther King once put it, a riot is the language of the unheard. 
And of course, there's the fact that this was the reaction when heavily armed and mainly white people stormed the Michigan State Capitol building, protesting not being able to get a haircut. And this was what happened when a diverse yet mainly black group were protesting living in fear of their lives. This is the time of year when there would normally be pride celebrations taking place all over the world, celebrating the glorious diversity of genders, relationships and orientations that many of us believe God created us to enjoy. In these days, it's important to remember that pride began as a riot, a protest outside a gay bar in New York. Primarily led and inspired by black and Latinx trans women like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, rocks were thrown. People were hurt. It wasn't a party, but it was necessary for change to happen. It's often been observed that every time we use religion to draw a line to keep people out, Jesus is with the people on the other side of that line. If you're looking for Jesus, it's a pretty safe bet you'll find him with the marginalised, the oppressed, the poor, the outsiders, the despised, the unclean. Edwin Markham who was the Poet Laureate of Oregon in the 1920s, wrote a very short poem called Outwitted. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Our relational, connectional, trinitarian God calls us to draw our circles larger and larger, connecting to those who are different from us, listening to and amplifying the voices that too often go unheard. Godliness comes from union with, being drawn into the eternal relationship of the triune God and into community with other people, those who are like us and those who are not like us. Godliness is about connection because that's what God is like. Jesus seemed to want connection with those around him, not separation. He touched human bodies that his own tradition saw as unclean, as if they were themselves holy. Dead little girls, menstruating women, lepers. The people of his day were disgusted that Jesus and his disciples ate with unwashed hands and they tried to shame him for it. But his response was, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth doesn't defile them, but what comes out of their mouth? That is what defiles them. Jesus kept violating boundaries of so-called purity and decency to get to the people on the other side of the boundary, those who'd been wounded by being shut out. Jesus cared about the connection of the human and the divine, the coming together of things that were formerly set apart. He cared about connection and godliness more than the appearance of purity. And he invites us to do that as well. In our reading today, he sends us out not to make converts, but to make disciples, followers and friends, those who will work for change, those who know the inclusive, embracing love of our triune God and will share it with others. The theologian and political activist Jim Wallace once said, a gospel message that doesn't try to change the world only works for those who don't need the world to change. Our triune God is a God of connection, of union with. It's messier and riskier than separation, than sticking to my own, but it's so much richer, so much more loving, endlessly knowable. So what does that look like in real terms, especially in a week like this one? What can we do about it? It's really hard, isn't it? I'm conscious that even by speaking about these things, I'm outside of my lane. As a white person, I've only ever experienced racism as a beneficiary. I see well-meaning attempts to address it, and almost as often I see them shot down as condescending or shallow, or looking like we've only just noticed that this is a problem. Lots of people are sharing pictures of police officers taking a knee, like Colin Kaepernick, as a gesture of solidarity. But it's understandable that many are cynical about that as an empty PR exercise if moments later the very same officers are prepared to use brutal tactics against legal, peaceful demonstrators. Activist Breyer Johnson expressed it this way. 
The police, kneeling with and hugging protesters, is like when your abusive boyfriend brings you flowers after hurting you. When he makes a grand gesture of love in front of your friends, it's to pressure you into forgiveness. It's manipulation. It's abuse. Don't fall for it. So, particularly for those of us who are white, what can we do about it? Because it's not enough just to not be racist. We need to be actively anti-racist. The biggest barrier to progressive change in any situation is not the bigoted few, but the majority who firmly insist we're not prejudiced, but do nothing to change a situation that we benefit from. Well, for a start, we can educate ourselves. And by that, I do mean ourselves, not calling up our black friends and asking them to do it for us. Because for most of us, our education on this subject is sadly lacking. As another Twitter user said this week, the only reason that British white people think we're less racist than Americans is because our history syllabus is 1066, some kings, skip the racist bits, the big wars we won. Google is your friend here. There are so many good books and essays and articles out there. Just get stuck in and be ready to be uncomfortable. The second thing that all of us can do is use our privilege to be good allies. Almost all of us have privilege in some area or another, whether it's ethnicity, sexuality, gender identity, being able-bodied or neurotypical or whatever. We can amplify other voices instead of speaking for or speaking over. We can stand with minority groups and allow our privilege to protect them. We can call out prejudice, stereotypes and jokes, even if it makes us uncomfortable. When we're in the majority, we can have the conversations that our friends who are in the minority then don't have to. So when you hear someone say, I don't see colour, call them out. Because A, yes they do, and B, not seeing colour in a racist world is just choosing not to see racism. When you hear someone saying, well, all lives matter, call them out. Because it's like saying the fire brigade should hose down every house in the street, even though only one house is burning down. Yes, all houses matter, but mine isn't on fire. Someone needs to have those conversations, and it shouldn't always have to be those who are on the receiving end of racism. Be a good ally. Be ready to do the work and to get uncomfortable and to face up to our own unconscious bias that I guarantee every one of us carries. That's not to say that we're all racist or ableist or homophobic or whatever, but that stuff is in the air we breathe. We're soaking in it every day. Always have been. If you don't believe me, try doing an unconscious bias test. There's one from Harvard that pops up if you Google it. And again, for those of us who are white, we're going to have to be uncomfortable because sometimes we should be uncomfortable. We can't just renounce our white privilege or opt out of all the ways we've benefited from it. We don't help anyone by getting defensive or centering ourselves and our feelings. This isn't about us. We need to get used to being uncomfortable to experience those feelings without forcing them to go away. It's a necessary emotional skill to have if we're going to work for a better world. It's never comfortable being confronted with our own privilege, but on the other side of that effort is a fairer, richer, better world for everybody. There's community, there's love. The very same community and love that we see at the heart of our triune God, our God in three persons, our God who is a dance, a party, an embrace. But we can't skip the steps we need to get there. And as Christians, we shouldn't be surprised by that. It's part of our story of discipleship, of going through the cross to get to resurre resurrection, of giving up our life so that we can save it. So it's been a bit heavy this week, hasn't it? If you've stuck with me, thank you. If you hit fast forward, that's okay. These are difficult times and there's only so much any of us can carry and process. If you found yourself turning away from the news and the internet this week, be kind to yourself. The work will still be there when you're strong enough to tackle it. When I was thinking about what I wanted to share today, I found myself thinking often of a poem written by a former Keele student named Eddie House that they shared with me a couple of years ago, and Eddie kindly gave me permission to share it today. 
So I'll close with this. It's called, I Met Jesus at a Riot. I met Jesus at a riot once, slim brown fingers gripping a homemade sign, and he passed me a lighter for my cigarette. Some people want to bleach the black out of others. Some want to beat the queer out of kids. Jesus told me that people see him as a watercolour man, faded at the edges, but on the inside he's all oils and heavy pigment. Later we sat in the dark corner of the pub, and he traced the condensation of his glass whilst I stared enraptured. He talked to me of gender and how true angels are non-binary and how in the resurrection we will all be like them. Jesus faces off against the Westboro Baptist Church, spreads his arms like wings and refuses to let them pass. He wears eyeliner to pride and drapes himself in rainbows, marches in the middle of the parade with a banner held high above his head. A girl stumbles at the picket. He reaches out a hand and I see her face fill with love. Jesus cries for the first time in front of me afterwards at how his father's name is used to oppress. Says he never meant for things to work out this way. I read Corinthians to him. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Loving and gracious God, you call all people to yourself. Hear the prayers we offer this day and equip us to enact change and build your kingdom. We pray for the victims of injustice. At this time especially, we pray for the victims of racism in the United States, in our own country and around the world. We pray for those who have been killed as a result of this hatred and all who grieve them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for a hunger for justice. At this time, we pray that the systems which uphold and enforce injustice may be broken down so that a fairer world may be built up. We pray that those who resist oppression be given strength and courage to work for what is right and that those who wield positions of authority and control will use their power to promote unity and equality. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for a transforming of ourselves. At this time, we pray for the courage to reflect on our own attitudes and privileges and to make ourselves vulnerable in the pursuit of justice. We pray for all those who harbour hatred and prejudice, that they may respond to your call to love and be open to your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for good relationships and communities. At this time, we pray for the building and sustaining of communities that champion fairness, grow compassion and foster kindness. May you, the relational God, inspire in us the desire for our human relations to mirror your divine love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are sick or suffering. At this time, we hold before you all who are ill and those who care for them. May we continue to grow in our understanding of what makes a compassionate and just society, learning to value those who work for the common good rather than selfish ambition. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Lord, you call us to be your light in the darkness, your voice in the wilderness, your hope for the hopeless. You give us strength in our weakness, peace and gentleness, words and boldness, to proclaim more of your love. Amen. stars and spiders. God is warm and bright and full of colour. God is our friend who loves us and calls us by name. We, we believe, believe in, in Jesus. Jesus. What is he like? Tell me about him. He was exciting. He told lots of stories. He listened to people. He made them think. Some people didn't like Jesus. They told lies about him. He was sentenced to death and killed. But God brought Jesus back to life again. Following Jesus is an adventure, a journey, a good surprise. We, we believe, believe in, in the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Tell me about her. What does she do? She helps us remember what Jesus said. She lets us know how much God loves us. She helps us to love other people. She's somewhere, someone we can't see but feel. Like the wind blowing in our hair. Like the warmth of a candle flame. We, we believe, believe God calls us. To do what? To love all people. To forgive them when they hurt us. To trust and not be afraid. To help make the world the place God wants it to be. To care for the world and enjoy it. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship. I pray that you might know God's presence in the coming days 
and may you know God's blessing, the blessing of God who is ever creating, always redeeming and constantly sustaining be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.